Hello everyone, welcome back to day 31 of Polity Daily Drill. Let's begin. First question. The 73rd Amendment Act of 1992, a landmark legislation in India aimed to revitalize the Panchayati Raj system, consider the following statements regarding the Act. First one. The Act mandates the constitution of Gram Sabhas in all villages with a population of more than 500. Now, according to the provisions of the Panchayati Raj system under our constitution, a Gram Sabha is a body comprising of persons registered in the electoral rolls, that's the voter list, relating to a village within the area of the Panchayat at the village level. The requirement for a Gram Sabha does not specifically hinge on villages having more than 500 people. Rather, it exists in every village with a proper voter list and electoral role, irrespective of population size. So, statement 1 is wrong. And also, the average population across the country, average population of a Gram Sabha is around 3400 people. And Gram Sabha means what? Gram Sabha is not just people of one village, it can be more than one villages also. So one is wrong. Second one, the Act stipulates mandatory reservation, mandatory reservation for backward classes, of seats for backward classes in Panchayats. Now if you refer to Article 243 capital D, which is a very important provision in the Panchayats with respect to reservation, you will find that mandatory reservation is meant for scheduled castes, it's meant for scheduled tribes and of course women. However, clause 6 very clearly says that it's completely optional, it depends on the state legislature whether it wishes to provide for reservation for backward classes or not. So it is not mandatory. The third one. It empowers panchayats with 29 subjects listed in the 10th schedule of the constitution. 29 subjects on which panchayats can be empowered are listed in the 11th schedule, not the 10th schedule. Why? Because 10th schedule contains provisions for anti-defection law. So there are 29 functional items like agriculture, land improvement, family welfare, etc on which panchayats can be empowered if the state legislature by law decides. Okay, so three is also wrong. Which of the above statements are incorrect? All of the above are incorrect. Moving on to question number two. The concept of a joint sitting of parliament in India is applicable in the case of joint sitting of a parliament. This is a provision mentioned under article 108, a very important article. Of course, we know that we have borrowed this concept from Australia. They have their section 57 in which this provision exists. And in India, we have had three joint sittings so far, though in Australia, they've had only one joint sitting so far in 1974. So, joint sitting will take place in the case of money bills. Yes or no? Of course not. Why? Because for money bills, Lok Sabha has the ultimate authority. For constitutional amendment bills, of course not. Why? Because in such cases or such bills must be passed by both the houses separately with a special majority. So A is wrong, C is wrong, which means of course D is wrong. Right answer is B, ordinary bills. Moving on to question number three. In the context of Indian polity, consider the following principles. Responsible government at the centre and state, executive being a part of legislature, parliamentary sovereignty, judicial supremacy. How many of these principles are embedded in the parliamentary form of government practised in India? So, parliamentary form has some very important features. A couple of them are, number one, a responsible and an accountable form of government. That is why Article 75 Clause 3 says that the Council of Ministers are collectively responsible to the Lok Sabha. And Article 164 Clause 2 says that the state 
states, the ministers at the state level, they are collectively responsible to the legislative assembly. Second feature is that the executive is a part of legislature. So, Article 75, Clause 5 for the centre, 164, Clause 4 for the states, wherein we know that every minister must ultimately become an MP or an MLA or an MLC, depending on what level we are referring to, right? So, yes, of course, you can be a minister without being a member of the house, but for a maximum period of six months only, right? So, ultimately, executive must be a part of legislature, two very important principles of the parliamentary form of government. So, right answer is B, only to, as far as parliamentary sovereignty is concerned, you know very well that in India, the parliamentary sovereignty is limited especially with respect to the constitution and concepts like basic structure doctrine. As far as judicial supremacy is concerned, countries like UK, which do have a parliamentary form of government, do not have a concept of judicial supremacy. They primarily have a concept of parliamentary supremacy. So, three and four are both incorrect. Moving on to now question number four. Consider the following statements regarding the special session of the parliament recently seen in news. Unlike regular sessions, special sessions of the parliament can be summoned by the speaker of Lok Sabha. Now, this is nonsense. Whether it's the regular session or a special session, the sessions are always summoned by the president, not by the presiding officer. So, one is wrong. Anyway, what are regular sessions? Regular sessions are the three sessions that are held regularly every year, starting with the budget session, then the monsoon session, and then the winter session, right? Any session beyond this can be termed or can be seen as a special session. That's it. Number two, guidelines for conducting special sessions are mentioned in the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha rules. No. No such guidelines are mentioned anywhere for conducting such special sessions. And number three, presiding officers of the respective house can limit the use of question hour during a special session. This is absolutely correct. Why only a special session? The presiding officers can limit the use of question hour in any and every session possible. So three is correct, one and two are wrong. How many statements is or are correct? A, only one. And the last question for today, with reference to the Ethics Committee and the Privilege Committee in the Lok Sabha, consider the following statements. The Ethics Committee can take complaints from any citizen, but the Privilege Committee can take complaints from members of the Parliament only. Absolutely correct. Number two, the Ethics Committee can take complaints only on the misconduct of an MP, but the Privilege Committee can take complaints against both MPs and non-MPs. Yes, even outsiders, if they try to breach the privilege of the House, the House can take up complaints against them as well. So, two is correct. Both the Ethics Committee and the Privilege Committee, with the prior consent of the Speaker, can take punitive action against a member. Why would the committees take up punitive action? They just make recommendations. Ultimately, the action is taken by the presiding officer, that is the Speaker of the House or a proper voting will take place in the House, right? So, three is wrong, one and two are correct. How many statements are correct? B, only two. This brings us to an end of our discussion for today. Let's meet tomorrow. Till then, that's all for me. Jai Hind.